One of the main problems of the human condition, especially just the way we brought up, and this is one of the things my job as a monk is to try and turn you in the opposite direction, is that we have grown up with what in Buddhism we call the fault-finding mind. And that fault-finding mind causes us a huge amount of suffering, it just wastes a lot of time, it makes us sick, and also it stops us actually enjoying life. Now let's give you one of the first stories. Now of course I'm over in Perth and I'm really busy, I have a lot of work to do, and uh, not just looking after one monastery, you're looking after three or four monasteries, and that's just in Western Australia. But there's two main responsibilities I had. We have this big 240-acre monastery and retreat centre to the south of Perth with 21 monks, which I was supposed to be teaching. We've also got this big nuns monastery, Bikuni Monastery, that's only 583 acres, and the city centre. And of course in that city centre, that's where we do most of the teaching, admin, uh, counselling, teaching meditation, that's our sort of centre in the, uh, just five kilometres outside the CBD. Now what is my usual schedule is on a Friday afternoon going into our city centre, getting as much admin done as possible, then teaching, counselling, looking after all the communities, and then Sunday afternoon, late, going back to the monastery and then teaching the monks for the next uh, five or six days and also admin of our monastery as well. But I tried to give myself a break. Now everybody should have a day off, so I thought I would give myself half a day off every Monday morning. The trouble was, there was so much to do, and I couldn't find the time to have just a bit of free time for myself. There were so many things needed fixing, or. Uh, letters which needed answering, emails which needed to be responded, there was just too much to do. And after a while, because you know, you're a monk, you know, you're looking at yourself, what sort of example am I setting for others, always running around doing things? And that's when I realised that what I needed to do was actually to come back on a Monday and look at my monastery, not with the eyes of an abbot, but with the eyes of a visitor. Because all these people coming and saying, what a beautiful, peaceful monastery you have. And I say, peaceful? Beautiful? Can't you see all the things which needed to be done? All the things which need to be fixed? All the roads which need to be swept? All the gutters which need to be cleaned? All the buildings which need to be repaired? All the things, answers which need to be done? Can't you see all the work which needs to be done? And I realise, if you're the abbot, the manager, all you ever see is the things which need to be fixed. The faults in that monastery. But if you're a visitor, you don't see the things which need to be fixed. You see the things which have already been done, which have been achieved. And I realised, at least one morning a week, I would be a visitor to the monastery in which I live. I walked around that monastery and I saw, actually, you were all right. It was a beautiful monastery. So much had been achieved. Because all I was doing was stopping myself looking at the faults, the things which need to be done, the things which need to be fixed, and instead looking at all the things which had been achieved, all the beautiful work which had been done over the years, the beautiful buildings, everything. And all it meant was just changing my attitude from a fault-finding mind to a mind of appreciation and gratitude. And only then could I rest and have some peace. And that taught me a lot about life. One of the reasons why you cannot maintain a relationship with somebody, why people get divorced, is because the one we're with, we just see their faults. We look at them with the eyes of a wife, with the eyes of a husband, with the eyes of a partner. 
And you know that sometimes people do come to me for marriage counselling. And I, I just, I can't understand why. I've already said I've never been married. What do I know about marriage? <laughs> but, I know about relationships, that's good enough. And this is, no, this is from this position here. I look at those two people, and they're both really good people. I've known them for a long time. I look at them, I've known her for years. She's just a kind, beautiful, gentle woman. I've known her for a long time. I've known you. you know, you've come to the monastery, you've stayed there, you're just a great guy, you know, you're very sensitive. You know, you're really a, a nice person. Why on earth can't you see what I see in you? And you know that helps a lot. Because instead of seeing their partner with a fault finding mind, they see their partner with a monk's mind, with a friend's mind. And they realise, yes, there is something very lovable, things to be respected, things to be grateful for in your partner. It's just changing the way you look at things, from a fault finder to a, a friend, to want someone who's grateful. And that's all one really needs to do. And that way, you think, my goodness, this person I'm about to get divorced from, they're actually not a, not a bad person. They've got some really good qualities. But even more than that, because when you start to see the beauty in your monastery, all the things which have been done, it's a greater sense of appreciation and feeling, hang on, haven't you done enough? Isn't this monastery already beautiful enough? How much more do you need to waste your life Try to make it even more beautiful and more perfect. It reminds me of one of my old stories. This is actually an old Buddhist story. For those of you who don't know me, I always repeat my stories. Just like, you know, if ever when I used to listen to the radio, I always used to you know, listen to the golden oldies, the old records of Jimi Hendrix, which I used to like. I didn't just listen to the ones, I liked to listen to them over and over and over again. So that's what you're going to get now. <laughs> But anyway, this is a beautiful story, it just fits in here. And that's the story of the most beautiful garden in the world, an old Zen story. Do you remember that one? That story was, there was a Zen garden in Japan. And it was famous throughout the whole country and overseas for being the most beautiful garden. Not just beauty, but it had a spiritual power behind it. And it was this old monk. And in these stories, Always beware of the old monks. This old monk heard about this garden and decided to check it out. So he travelled to the place where the garden was, but arrived very early in the morning. It was locked, but that didn't stop the old monk. He climbed over the gate and got in. And it was just before the young monk who was the gardener came out to start the morning's work. So the old monk hid behind the bushes to get the secrets of the most beautiful Zen garden in the whole of the country. And he watched as this young monk took two big uh, baskets and he went into this courtyard of this, this Zen garden at a big plum tree in the middle with gravel and moss rocks and little lanterns and bridges as you've seen in great Zen gardens. And with those two baskets he looked at every leaf and twig which had fallen the night before from the plum tree. And he put them in the baskets. But before putting them in the basket he examined them. If they were pretty, had a nice colour, then he put them in the good basket. If they were deformed, not really useful for him, he put them in the rubbish basket. So he actually split up the leaves and the twigs into two <laughs> different baskets, the beautiful and the ugly. And after spending two or three hours picking up every leaf by hand and separating them, then he went to the back of the temple 
and threw all the ugly leaves and twigs in the rubbish bin, in his compost pile. And then he broke for tea and some meditation before he started the most important part of his gardening. After tea and meditation, he took the basket of beautiful leaves and twigs and arranged them one by one in that garden. He was one of these people who have the great artistic sense. I've got no artistic sense. You ask me what colour you should paint something, oh white will do, anything will do. I'm not, I haven't got that sense, the right colour and arrangement which some people are gifted with. But this monk had that gift. He was an artist. He arranged those leaves and twigs in that garden in such a way he looked absolutely gorgeous. And sometimes, as I wrote in the book, sometimes he would look at the leaf and realise it was not quite right and just turn it slightly and then smile. Because it had to be just the right orientation to make this garden so beautiful. And after this five or six hours of work, when he was finished, then the young monk would open up the garden to visitors in the afternoon. He was that meticulous, put forth so much effort and care. That was why it was the most beautiful garden in the whole of Japan. But of course, the old monk who was watching all that time, when the young monk was finished, the old monk came out of the bushes and said, I've been watching you all morning and I've come here to say just how impressed I am with your energy, your effort, your care and your artistic skill. Your garden, your garden is almost perfect. And that word, almost, <laughs> the colour drained from the old monk, from the young monk's face. His lips quivered and he fell to his knees. What do you mean? Oh, oh, almost perfect. Please, can you tell me how to make my garden totally perfect? And that the old monk said, do you really want to know? Oh, please be compassionate to me. Show me how my garden can be totally perfect. And at that, the old monk went to the centre of the garden and he put his old but still strong arms around the plum tree and shook the hair out of it. <laughs> Leaves and twigs went all over the place. The work, six or seven hours of morning work of that young monk were totally ruined. He was devastated. He was angry. What have you done? And you know what the old monk said? Now your garden is perfect. And I love that story, because sometimes, why do you work so hard? Why do you look for an even more sensitive, kind partner? Why are you looking for something more? Because you have the fault-finding mind, not the mind of gratitude. That old man was saying, yeah, that's perfect. How many of you like going into the bush around Sydney? Have you ever gone into the bush and seen all the trees in nice rows and lines? If you have, they've been planted by the government. <laughs> <laughs> but in nature, they never like that. They're all over the place. They're haphazard, leaning this way and that way. Some are dead, some have got limbs sort of coming off them. That's what makes it beautiful. You understand what we're saying? The fault finding mind just sees what's right. And it means we can never appreciate what's right. It means we never find any happiness. It means we will never find any peace or rest. Because we're always trying hard to make the garden perfect, not realizing it's pretty good as it already is. If you understand that, you can understand how you can live with somebody. Don't try and make them perfect. 
If you do, you'll be a very lonely person. You'll never have a friend at all. I've been, I've got, this year I've got 21 monks in my monastery. That's me and 20 others. Not one of them is perfect. If I try and make them perfect, I will have a headache. And I say that to Ajahn Sujata, so how many monks and nuns have you got in your monastery? How many are perfect? <laughs> <laughs> good enough. Because if you try and make them perfect, you just get a headache again. So, and it's also, you're not appreciating them. And in any community, if you don't appreciate the people you live with, you have these terrible problems with each other. So, when you understand about the fault finding, instead of finding fault with things, look, I, I just was reading about the riots in London. Where are they coming from? Now, I know where they're coming from because years and years and years ago I was visiting my mother in London and as I was walking from her apartment to actually the Sri Lankan temple, you know, the one which is in Chiswick as I was walking there to give a talk I passed two young men who were sitting waiting for a bus and there was, there was no bus shelter, there was no bench, they were sitting on a garden wall and the garden wall you know, had bricks, which instead of being flat, were rounded. It, you know, it looked very nice. But because they were rounded bricks, it was very uncomfortable on their bums when they sat. And I heard one say to the other, saying, they shouldn't make walls like this. And my goodness, they've got some place to sit on. Why are you so fault-finding? And I've also seen this also with kids. I remember on purpose, many times I went on public transport, even though the people wanted to give me a lift. Because I wanted to listen to people, see how they talked. And sometimes I've been on buses, you know, packed with school kids, you know, on the way home after a day at school. I remember sitting behind these two girls, the best friends, as they were going home, listening to how they spoke to each other. And these weren't enemies, these were best friends. No. You, your, your breasts are too flat. Yeah, but you've got a big nose. No boy will ever go out with you. And they won't go out with you either. <laughs> and this is how friends talk to each other. So I don't know what the enemies would do. <laughs> this is no peer pressure. I remember from my school days, it was the same between the boys. How much negativity do we hear? How much fault finding do we are we exposed to? And that degree of negativity, fault finding, lack of appreciation, lack of gratitude, that's one of the problems. Well that when people get to this negative that they want to destroy, simply because they haven't developed the other mind. Now the other mind, instead of fault finding, gratitude. One of the problems, it's not just telling you the problem, it's telling you how to fix it. And one of the great ways of fixing it. And one of the things which monks and nuns, what we should be doing, and the monks and nuns here do a pretty good job, there's a good bunch of uh, monastics here, is inspiring people. It's actually getting inspiration and sharing it with people. It's not just telling you what Buddhism is. You can read that in books. It's not just you know, pointing out these faults. You can get them in psychology conferences which is the reason I'm here this weekend. The great thing about religious leaders, what they should be doing, is inspiring people. Because when you have inspiration, you're not looking at the faults anymore. You're seeing at the beauty, not just the ordinary beauty, but the spiritual beauty of what actually is possible for human beings. And that takes away so much negativity. The reason why things like those rights, the reason why there is divorce, drug abuse, is a lack of inspiration in our communities. People who just move us to a higher level to show what's really possible. Because when you have those inspiring images and they're replayed to your brain or your mind again and again and again, they do uplift you. They make you live a higher level of life. 
I've been fortunate to have had very inspiring examples in my life. And I know what it's done for me. But let's go back to the early, no, the really early part of my life. I've often talked about my father as an inspiring example. One of the reasons he was inspiring was because he was a victim of gross domestic abuse from his own father. I remember talking to him. I was concerned. Why, Dad, don't you talk about our grandfather? My grandfather, you know, he died during the Second World War in Liverpool. Why didn't you ever mention him? You know, as a kid, you want to know about your parents and grandparents. And one day, when he thought I was old enough, he told me, he said, because your grandfather was a bastard. He said, he was. Said, what do you mean by that? He said, because he was a plumber in Liverpool during the Depression, that's the 1930s. A dead-end job. After work, you go to the pub, get drunk, come home almost every night, take off his belt, and just you know, whip whatever kid came close by, and then he would beat up his wife, my father's mother. You've all heard cases of domestic abuse. In those days, there were no police to go to. There were no refuges. You just had to take it. There was no escape. So that's why he was a bastard. And he said to me, I said, well, why aren't you like that? Because what I heard in psychology, the victims of abuse usually tend to transfer their abuse to others. But he said to me, he said, look, when I was on the end of any of those beatings, for no reason at all, just because I was in the way, that I thought if ever I had a kid, I would never ever do that to them. Because I knew how it felt. I knew the pain, not just physical pain, just the emotional hurt of the person who's supposed to be protecting you, doing such gross violence to you. He said, I would never do that. And he never could. He could never hit us. Why? Because he remembered what it was like. When he told me that, it inspired me. You don't need to revisit the violence which you've received on anybody else. You have been hurt. Every one of you in this room, big or small, you have been hurt, abused, cheated. But that doesn't mean you have to do that to anybody else. Don't you realise how much it hurts? The pain it really gives you Again, the physical pain, that disappears. The emotional, the mental scars, that's sometimes there for such a long time. And to know what it feels like, and then to say, I will never do that to anyone else. It's another way, inspiring way, a way that we can move away from violence and abuse. Well, he taught me. And I taught that to victims of torture and trauma. One of my disciples works in a group over in Perth. These are these migrants coming from some of these countries. And if you hear what they've been through, you know, real torture, stuff which would make your flesh creep. Jesus, come in. I'll help you. What can I do for you? Once you hear what they've, they've gone through. But they've got that choice, like each one of us had. Are we going to use this to punish others? Or are we going to follow a path of inspiration? And those inspiring examples, they uplift us. People who've really been through the mill and come out afterwards and have been such compassionate, kind, soft, gentle people. It shows us there is another way. No more tit for tat, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth business. You've hurt me, I'm going to be kind to you. That's what I call inspiration. Look, there's so many Sri Lankans here this evening. The war has been over how many years? I don't care, it's a long time ago now. But no tit for tat. Whoever's been hurt and killed, injured, 
abuse, whoever it is. Give back compassion for your abuse. Don't give out vengeance. You've seen people do that. And that inspires us. It inspires us because if those people could do that and they've really, really been hurt and abused, why do you get angry at your wife because she said some things she shouldn't? Why can't you forgive your husband because he's had an affair? Okay? Is that as bad as being raped and tortured? Look, inspiration. That is what is going to move this planet into a much better place. Not just inspiration with forgiveness. Just inspiration is what we can achieve. And if we look for just, instead of finding faults with things, we put that aside. Yeah, you know, it was a fault. You know, your husband should never do that. Anyone who does that is bad husband, bad karma, remember? So you've done a bad thing. But let's move away from just blaming and, and criticizing into something which is more inspiring. Just the great forgiveness. And also the great forgiveness. In the middle of that is that word give. It's a beautiful word to give. Now look, I don't get anything out of coming here. So I just give. This is my life, just to give as much as I possibly can to know each one of you, not just here in Sydney, but throughout the world. To be able to give, that's my generosity. And there's something really weird. You know, I should be really tired and exhausted, but the more you give, the more energy you have. This was again one of those stories which I learned. Because part of being a monk is not just sitting down meditating and you know, learning Pali. Now we learn a lot from experience. So when we have these experiences of life, what we have, we've got the time to actually to sit back and think what happened and why. To so take our life's experiences and really allow them to be processed and understand their meaning. Unfortunately, when you're really, really busy, you go through life and you don't have time to process it, you have to do something else. Monks and nuns have that opportunity. And this particular example was early year in Thailand. Early years in Thailand, and there was this one occasion where you know, we were making our robes. Now you see this brown colored robes we have here. It's easy these days, these are pre-dyed. In fact, then this one just came from a shop. It wasn't Gucci, it wasn't Versace, it was just monk shop. We don't have designer robes. <laughs> well, I do that's one well day. Maybe I can have sort of uh, Armani robe. Right. <laughs> Would that be a good idea? <laughs> of course. What do you want one of those for? So, <laughs> we, make, we make our own robes out of white cloth. Now, okay, like, I'm a guy, a theoretical physicist, in my head. So I had to learn how to sew. Never done that before. I had to learn how to sew your own robes, cut them up, measure them. I could measure things, you know, science. And then you had to dye them. And to dye them, what you had to do is, you now this was you know, in the bush of northeast Thailand. You, know, you had to draw your own water out of the well, no taps, find wood to start a fire, boil that water, and we used to use the wood from a jackfruit tree. To cut it up with a machete, you had to sharpen the machete yourself. Cut the chips up and up and up again. And just a child, you remember that, what we used to do. It took a huge amount of time to boil those chips so you get the dye, the, the sap out of it, and then boil that water to concentrate it, and then to dye your robe, maybe three or four times to dye your robe until you've got the right colour. It was like two or three days of non-stop work. And on this occasion, there was three or four monks, they were making their robes. You know one of those robes was Ajahn Kwesiko? Ajahn Kwesiko, he's one of our friends, he's this Japanese monk. And at the time, his lay name was Shibahashi. That was his name. It's a Japanese name, Shibahashi. But in Thai, they couldn't pronounce Shibahashi. So Ajahn Chah gave him the nickname, Sibat Hasip which any Thai people here know means four baht fifty cents. <laughs> so here was four dollars fifty. <laughs> so it was 
couldn't remember. He's a very famous monk now in Thailand, and four dollars fifty. <laughs> he was one of those monks. He's a good friend. But anyway, they were up all night. They'd already done, I think, uh, two nights. And this was going to be their third night. And I know I, I took compassion on them, put pity on them. But you know, I've been up. You know, Going without sleep for one night is not that bad. Then two nights you can handle, but three nights it really gets tough. It's almost torturous. You can't even think straight. So I went up to them. Now it was late at night, after we'd done our chanting and meditation, maybe 9, 9.30. And I said, guys, look, you go to bed. This is secret. Don't tell anybody, because you may get into trouble. I look after the, the dipot for you all night. And you go and have a sleep. You know, they, they didn't argue with me. They were off. Because <laughs> when they really needed a rest, just the opportunity, just for the three or four hours to lay down, we haven't slept for a couple of days. Oh, that was bliss. And so I was looking after it. You know, there's a lot of work all by myself. I hadn't slept that day myself. And then, three o'clock in the morning, we had the bell. And so they came up, maybe 3.15, and I went to the, the morning meeting, meditation and chanting. Because I'd worked all night for them. But it was really strange. In those days, you know, when I meditated, you had lots of sleepiness. You were dull. It was very, very hard in that climate. It was, it was a, a tropical climate. Three o'clock in the morning, sleep deprived. You know, and I was, I was made in England. I'm not used to that. It'd be great if had an air conditioner, even a fan. There was nothing like that. No electricity. But that morning, I wasn't tired at all. I was so bright. And so sort of alert. And that was really strange. I stayed up all night, but I had all this energy. It was only later on I asked the senior monk there, what is going on? Why is this happening? Why have I got so much energy? It was very simple. You've done something inspiring for others. You know, you've given up your own night's rest to help somebody else for a beautiful motive. You always get energized because of that. That's what I learned about service. When you really look after somebody else. When you do community service. When you go to work in a hospital or for some good cause. You don't get that tired. You get inspired. And that inspiration is a huge source of energy and happiness for people. You're not fault finding. Fault finding leads to depression and riots in London and anywhere else in this world. How many people in Sydney suffer from depression? And what do they usually do? They go to the doctor, get some medication or maybe do some counselling or even do meditation. There's a fourth therapy which prevents, if you are depressed, overcomes it and that's community service. Helping out your local church or temple or school, hospital, whatever. Doing something for others. That really inspires you. And that inspiration gives you this huge source of energy. You feel worthwhile. You feel happy. You feel you don't get depressed anymore. Because depression comes from fault finding. This is developing the inspiration. And when you do things like that, you understand, you want to serve. I put my hand up first to serve. And it gets, it gets like there's a beautiful thing in the monastery. I hope this is like your monastery. I never really stayed there. I'm always like a visitor. But I've tried to develop among my community over in Perth this idea it doesn't matter whose turn it is. The first person to get to do it, to sweep the leaves, to take the rubbish out, whatever else, they rush to do it. Didn't care. You did it last week. Yeah, no, but you weren't quick enough. I'm going to do it again this week. <laughs> you just want to do it just for fun. It needs to be done. Let's just do it. That's what we mean by like this service. And I was just told this just to uh, a group of Malaysians last night. Because I'm always giving talks, and there's a few, few Malaysians who have come and listened to, to my talks. Uh, actually, they came from my 60th birthday. I'm 60 now. I'm officially an old monk. No, not that old. But anyway, they came along for that, so they're doing a retreat now. I told them that 
again, one of those strange Asian things which I saw when I was a young monk in Thailand was washing feet. So it was obvious because you, know, you, went, you went barefoot on arms round in the morning and there was again no roads through the dusty, you know, sandy uh, bypaths into the village. And when you came back, you know, you, your feet were dirty. So you'd always have this little uh, place you could wash your feet, then buy them and go inside. You know, didn't have shoes and slippers to wear there. But what happened when a great monk like Ajahn Chah, my teacher, when he came back, he would wash his feet. Other monks would wash them for him. They used to anger the see that you get the priest coming into the house, and you wash their feet. What the heck do you do that for? These monks, they're old enough to wash their own feet. <laughs> Not only that, the feet are perfectly clean. They just come out from your car. <laughs> what do you want to wash them for? Now that's the sort of thing I thought. Now this question of this form find, I saw all these monks rushing up to wash, wash Ajahn Chah's feet. That's a really stupid, that's a type of Buddhism which I don't agree with. Just these rituals, you know, sucking up to the hierarchy. You know, why do you have to do this? Now, if I, if I had my way, I'd get this little, uh, like a garden hose, so he could actually spray his feet, much more efficient, with less water. But now we've all these, and it wasn't just one of them, it was about 10 or 20, you know, were around his feet. Now probably many of them won't be able to reach him. That's really ridiculous. I mean, really sick, some of these rituals which people have. But of course, everyone was doing it. And one of the things which I was taught, I encourage you, is just give it a try, see what happens. Investigate, experiment. Don't just sit there and think about it. Just understand why. So the only way I could understand what was going on, I decided one day I would try that. Now, swallowing my pride, swallowing all my sort of you know, Western conditioning, I said, tomorrow I'm going to go and wash out my teacher's feet. And I had to prepare for this, because I knew you had to be quick. <laughs> so there I was, waiting, like Usain Bolt at the start of the 100 meters, you know, all coiled up, waiting for the starting gun. Really tense. And I saw a gentle child coming, and I was up. You know what? I was fast enough to get a whole toe all by myself. <laughs> I got one of my teacher's toes. And I washed it. <laughs> I think I'm going crazy because I enjoyed that so much. I can even remember it now. That's about 38 years ago, 37 years ago. The day when I washed one toe. <laughs> and then I realised what inspiration is. Is serving, not because the person needs to be served, but because I needed to do the serving. It's just a total change of attitude. That's why when people ask you, can I open the door for you? Yeah, open the door. If they ask you, like you know, these Boy Scouts used to do, can I take you over the road? Yeah, go over the road. Even when you don't need to go. <laughs> when the Boy Scouts go, you can cross to the right side of the road again. And when they ask you, let them. <laughs> That's why people give me all these gifts. I don't promise this is for you. This is for you. Say, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then they go, I'll give it to somebody else. <laughs> really? <laughs> Once these people from Bangkok came up to our forest monastery in Thailand. Because we, you know, we had these old plastic shoes. And they bought these, these leather shoes for the monks. Really expensive, no, not too like sandals. And so we all wore them. They were hell to wear, uncomfortable, impractical, but we wore them for two or three days. And then the people from Bangkok went back, we waved them off, and we got our old shoes back. <laughs> <laughs> we did that at the time because we wanted to inspire them. This is, this is what happened in Perth once. Now look, I never wear socks. You know, because you now, again, I've got really good circulation. I'm used to this in the UK. Even when I was at Cambridge University, I would never wear socks even in the snow. And I'd wear the sandals, even then, flip flops, to keep it simple, and just no socks. I've got good circulation, don't need them. But one day, 
This was over in, no, in Perth. Over in Perth, this lady knitted me some socks. This dear old lady. Actually, she's a bit sick now. She's on her deathbed, actually. But anyway, she made me some socks. Just before the talk. So, of course. Do I tell her, no, I don't wear socks? Of course you don't do that. I put the socks on. And as I put the socks on, and I went to give the talk, I was sitting cross no, I was sitting cross legs while I was giving the talk. So you know, you usually can't see my feet. And as I was giving the talk, and I remember she was sitting to my right, and then I was just wiggling around and I just put a foot out. <laughs> on purpose. I did it deliberately. And I saw her in the corner over there, turned around and bit of my talk. He's wearing my socks! He's not wearing my socks! <laughs> That's what inspiration is. It was fun. I don't need those socks. But she needed to see me wearing it. I did that in Melbourne once when I visited this poor Sri Lankan lady who was in hospital dying of cancer. She also gave me some socks to wear. Oh, right, this is a lovely memory. She gave me some socks to wear, so I put them on for her. But also, when, because you know, I, I remember just the path in, I knew where her room was. And as we went out of the hospital to the car park, I knew her room was overlooking the path where I had to go from the entrance to the car park. And of course, I knew she would probably be looking. So, as I walked, instead of walking like a proper monk does mindfully, I kicked my heels up <laughs> so she could see the socks. But I did that first, and I looked at the window and saw her looking at me with a big lid on her face. <laughs> he was wearing my socks. Isn't generosity and kindness inspiring? It is. So if someone gives you a gift, don't say, oh, I don't need that. Oh, I don't want that. Why on earth do you give a monk a comb? Many monk people are giving me a comb. <laughs> No, I'm using it. I'll try something. I don't know. Because that's what's really inspiring. It's actually to share gifts together. To receive and to give. Whatever we can do. And that actually, that sharing, rather than taking. You know, I'm just going to see how much I can rip off. I'm seeing how much I can exploit out of you. How much I can get. It's not about getting. It's not about giving. It's about sharing. And that's what the beautiful thing about being a monk. Every day, people come and share their food with me. Every day with the, with the Sati Monastery, you go there and share. And sometimes you look at how much food. I've been to Sati, how much food do you get there? But we actually get heaps more over in Perth. What do we need all that food for? We don't need that food. But you need to share it with us. That's one of the reasons I'm fat and overweight. It's just compassion and kindness. <laughs> I don't need your food, but you need it to feed me. <laughs> well, that becomes what we mean by it's, but it's more than that. You know, sometimes people do such incredibly things which so uplift us. And the inspiration. I remember this story which one of the first monks who went to England said, and I know England, I was born there and lived there, just to know how negative that place can be sometimes. That's why, you know, what do you call us in, here in Australia, the whinging palms? <laughs> and then there's a reason for that. But it's not just whinging palms now, that whinging disease has spread to many places in the world. And I've always seen the bad in our politicians. Always seeing their faults. And I've hung out with a few politicians, not just here in Australia. They're so hard. Everything they do, the good stuff, is just taken for granted. There's one fault, one mistake in their policy, and they're in the newspapers, character or characterised as idiots. Imagine that with you. You might have to have a very, very tough skin to be a politician. And no wonder that some of them get depressed. I remember telling, okay, this is another golden oldie story. I remember telling, you know, for, uh, those of you in Sri Lanka, the first time I went to see your president, uh, Hindu Rajapaksa, 
I knew he was in a lot of trouble because always being criticised, the conduct of the war, whatever. And I told him the story of the donkey. Once upon a time, there was a donkey. And this donkey was walking in the forest, minding his own business. In Buddhism we would say he wasn't mindful. Because not noticing where he was going, he fell into a hole. It was a well in the middle of the forest. Fortunately, the well was dry. But, he found himself, he wasn't injured, just a bit bruised, he found himself in the bottom of this well. And there was no one else around. Now, donkeys, they can't climb out of wells. He was stuck down there. So the only thing he could think of doing was shouting out, Eeyore! 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 said the donkey. And of course, there's no one around. But that was the only way he could be saved, by getting some help. So for a couple of hours, Eeyore! 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 And eventually, finally, someone found him. But the person who discovered him was this really mean, bad farmer. And as soon as he looked into that well to see where this noise was coming from, he saw the stupid donkey. He never liked that donkey. But he also realised that was a dangerous well. Somebody else might fall down in that well. So he said to himself, you know, it's not like, you know, he actually said it's like killing two birds with one stone. But in Buddhism we never use that simile, that's not a good Buddhist simile, killing two birds with one stone. We say, cutting two carrots with one knife. <laughs> okay, so we've got to change these old similes. <laughs> so anyway, by cutting two carrots with one knife. The same with that other simile. How many have you heard that simile? If you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for the rest of his life and teach him to break all his precepts. <laughs> so we don't do that, no. The Buddhist simile is you give a man a carrot, you feed him for a day, you teach him how to grow a veggie garden, and you feed him for the rest of his life. You see, so we thought this, we have to change these similes, and just uh, get, improve them. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the, the donkey was in the bottom of the well, and this really bad farmer wanted to cut two carrots with the same knife. In other words, he wanted to get rid of the donkey and also get rid of the danger of the hole. So he took out a spade and started throwing dirt into the hole. He was going to bury the donkey alive, thereby killing the donkey and filling up the well. What a great idea. So shovel after shovel full of dirt fell on top of the donkey. And the donkey didn't know what was going on. He is trying to help me. And when the donkey figured out that that bad farmer was trying to bury him alive, Eeyo! 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 He really started to shout. And that just encouraged the farmer. More and more shovelfuls of dirt. Eeyo! In donkey language, that means don't do it. Actually, means something much worse than that. You know the other words which you use in Sydney, but that's a limit to what I can say. <laughs> but anyway, in e or language, I'd be very rude. But after a few minutes, the donkey fell quiet, and the farmer thought, "I've killed that donkey at last." So he relaxed and just shoveled the, the earth in because he knew he buried the donkey, killed it. He was just filling up the well now. But the donkey wasn't dead. The donkey had got what we call in Buddhism insight. Have you ever done an insight meditation? This is a way of doing insight meditation. Get someone to throw dirt on top of you at the bottom of a well. <laughs> <laughs> because the insight the donkey had was this. When people throw dirt all over you, just shrug it off. Stamp it in. And then you find every shovel full of earth 
shrug it off, stamp it in, and you're a centimeter higher. Another sample of earth, shake it off, stamp it in, and you're another centimeter higher. So every shovel full of earth, the donkey wasn't complaining, no fault finding, but being very grateful for that farmer, just stamping in the earth, and a centimeter, and a centimeter, and a centimeter higher. And that farmer was so stupid, absent money throwing dirt into the well, he didn't notice when a pair of donkey ears appeared just above the rim of the well. He didn't even see a whole head appear. And he didn't even see when the donkey was close enough to the top of the well, he could just jump out, and according to the story I read, the donkey bit the farmer on the backside just to teach him the law of karma. <laughs> and then he ran away. <laughs> and that's how the Actually, the story I read was he was teaching the, the man. This is a, a terrible pun, but I, I'm going to repeat it. He was teaching the farmer to always watch your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, or your ass, whichever way you want to sort of pronounce, because now donkey and ass is the same word. Okay, never mind, anyway. <laughs> so the moral of that story is that people are going to throw shit all over you from time to time. They are going to criticise you, they are going to, to tell you things you, you know, which you never did, or they interpret the total wrong way, you never deserve it, I never did that, I never meant that, and they're still going to sort of throw dirt all over you. Don't complain. If someone calls you an idiot, stupid, whatever, all you need to do, what should you do? Shrug it off. Stamp it in and you're a bit higher. You know the politicians love that. Because they get dirt thrown over them every day. Instead of complaining, shrug it off, stamp it in, get a little bit higher. It's a beautiful little simile for life. So you see that so some of these people that, it's very hard when they get so much criticism, and that's one of the reasons. They always say that we live in a representative democracy. So you get the politicians which represent you. They are an image of the voters. If the voters are greedy, they just want sort of more money in their hip pockets. That's the sort of politicians you get. Every now and again though we get inspired. Inspired to get someone who's actually got vision or inspiration. They want to sort of lift up the community to something which is high and beautiful and wonderful. It's a dream. And too often the forefathers say, you can't do it, it's impossible. I spent my whole life doing the impossible. You know, building monasteries. Look, when we first started, whether it was Santa or other monasteries there, people actually said, you guys are crazy. How on earth do you think they'd, they'd give any money to a bunch of bald-headed bald headed blokes who won't even get a job. Why? But little by little we did that. I always remember how, because I was having a fundraiser for our, our Bikuni monastery over in Perth, how that monastery started. Again, you just had to show leadership and inspiration. Let's do it. And I said it can't be done. And I, when the people say that, I hope they, when they, they say that to you, Ajahn that just, that just gives you energy. That just feeds you. If it can't be done, I'm going to do it. When they say it can't be done, so start the fund. I remember this, this beautiful time. We had about $5,000, $6,000 in the bank. And that's not enough to buy any land or do anything to start a, a monastery for Buddhist women. And then I got this telephone call from one of my friends that somebody wanted to make a donation. And they came to visit me. And he told me, he was this Australian Caucasian guy. He said he t I saw him twice, I haven't seen him since. He said that, you know, he came in jeans, just this ordinary guy, looked like he was just you know, out of the nightclub. And he said, I've come here to give a donation because my wife has just given birth to my first child. It's a girl. I want to do something for my daughter. 
then he was a Buddhist, and he said, uh, I don't know if my daughter would ever want to become a Buddhist nun. Probably she never will, but I want to give her that opportunity and chance. And I hear you're building this place. And he wrote out a check for $250,000. And I remember that even now, that just said, give me goosebumps. And he came and he went, and I've hardly ever seen him again. That's an incredible act of kindness and generosity. I don't know who he was, if he's a really wealthy person or not. But that was so inspiring to do something just because it needed to be done. And I've seen so many other beautiful acts like that. I remember this Laotian lady in early days, she was a refugee. She came to see me in tears. Her mother had been resettled to uh, Portland in Oregon with the rest of her family. And for some era in the processing of these refugees from the Vietnam War, this Russian girl was resettled to Perth, alone, apart from her whole family. She's the only one who came to Australia. And all the other families settled over in the United States. She just got a telegram, you know, days before emails. Her mother was really sick, was dying. From her other family, can you come quick to see your mother before it's too late? She came to me crying. She was a refugee. No way she could have any money to get a, a ticket, an air ticket to the United States. She realized she couldn't go and that she would never see her mother again. Her mother was dying. Can you imagine how that feels? As I was trying to counsel her and think what I could do, right behind her was a Thai girl who was just arranging the flowers. The reason why she was free to arrange the flowers because she was invalid on a pension. And I saw her, without mentioning, saying anything, take out her checkbook from the purse and give a blank check this girl. Go and see your mother, doesn't matter how much it costs. That wasn't a rich lady. That was a lady on a pension. She was a nurse who had a bad back and the insurance company would not pay her out. They were following her around with cameras. I knew how poor she was, but she could do that. Why? And those are the things which inspire me. It's impossible. It shouldn't be done. It's like Washing out your child's toe, it's a stupid thing to do, but it just needs to be done. It uplifts and makes society, this beautiful society, that our beauty, that is inspiration. And that's what we monks were supposed to be doing. I do as much of that as I possibly can myself. As the Zajan Sujato, the sisters behind me, the nuns, as you do, we need to do more. Things which are just so wonderful. Look, you know, I, other stories which come up. I was, you know, I, mean, I was not born an enlightened being. I'm just like anybody else you learn on the, on the job. I remember that in our monastery over in Perth, we were building a hall. We needed a hall. And yeah, by this time, I was a good builder. And I had these plans for the hall. Unfortunately, the monk who was senior to me, Ajahn Jaco, had other plans. And we had a standoff. We had an argument for about three days. We were passing to each other the reasons why your design is impractical and stupid. So for three days, I had an argument with, remember Ajahn Jaco, for those of you who remember him, had an argument with him. It took me three days to come to my senses. I was sure I was right. But I went to his room and I said, I apologize for arguing with you. He said, please, I agree with your design on one condition. And that condition is, you give me permission to be the builder. I want to build your hall, the one which you designed. And of course, <laughs> he gave me permission. So those of you who ever go to our monastery in Perth, you'll see that stupid hall facing the wrong direction. <laughs> an incredibly expensive roof, which could have been done for half the price. I built that. 
And I'm so proud that I did that. <laughs> My name's on the building license. And I think, now that is inspiring, because it doesn't matter if it's a stupid one, it doesn't matter if it's in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter if it could be done for half the price. The important thing was, you did something inspiring. Now, I'd built a hall which I didn't believe in. That was so good. You try and do that. So if your husband says, you know, oh, if your wife says, we need a new kitchen, and you want to spend the money on a holiday to Sri Lanka, you go and get a new kitchen for your wife. And you pay for it. And you, and you even put it in or whatever. You just do that, because it's inspiring. Just to go against your own ideas and just to do something just because it's uplifting to do. Goes against the grain, what we say in Buddhism, goes against the stream of craving. Goes against selfishness, what I want, and does something which is beautiful and wonderful. You know, I live my life on inspiration. Sometimes, that again, you get tired, you do impossible things. But inspiration keeps me going. Sometimes you travel around the world and you get so tired and you've got to give a talk. You know what I do? I think of all the beautiful things which I've achieved and other people have achieved. I don't think, why me? Why? Look, Ajahn Chajat is a great teacher. Why are you importing monks all the way from Western Australia? You've got the beautiful nuns behind. He can give talks. Why do you want me? Look, all you Sri Lankans, how many monks are there in Sri Lanka? Why do you have to send me over there? <laughs> They're ridiculous. Now, it is like you know, sending coals to Newcastle, as they say. And sometimes you get so tired, exhausted, physically drained, that if someone wants to ask you that having trouble, and they call you up. You know what happened recently at the beginning of our retreat? At last, after all the work, I had a chance to relax and rest. And I got an email. One of my disciples' husbands in Singapore had died. This was on a Monday. The funeral was on a Tuesday. Can you come? And I thought, that's stupid. That's impossible. And I've been working so hard. Now's retreat time. Time to rest. And how can you, Monday, get to Singapore by Tuesday? So of course, <laughs> I went. And I went there because it was impossible, because it was a stupid thing to do. And I love that so much. Just helping out a person, serving them, even though they said afterwards, look, we never expected you to come. It was so wonderful you did. You do the same. Someone asks you to, for help, and you're just so busy. Go. One of my friends, he had a little business, it was quite successful. You know, making these little calendars, you know, calendars just for the local area, by like going to all the shopkeepers and businesses so they could advertise in that and giving out these little calendars for free. And this was many years ago. Because of his own business, he had a bit of time. So when this old acquaintance, this old lady, sort of needed some help, she gave him a call, look, I can't drive, can't really afford the taxi. And can you take me to the doctor? Well, there's no, no, the, no bus service there. So he said, yeah, sure, I can take an hour off. So he would drive this old lady around whenever she really needed some help. And he told me that one day this old lady said, I need to see my lawyer. Now, can you please drive me? He said, yeah, sure. So he drove her to the lawyer's office. And he said, uh, would you mind coming in? I need you to be with me. Yeah, sure. You know, maybe a witness or something, he thought. And when he went to the lawyer's office, he had to sign the deed because she was bequeathing all her money. She was a multi-millionaire to this guy. He said, you were kind to me. My other children, they just don't even bother. But you were kind. And so he inherited, I don't know how many millions of dollars, simply because he was kind. It's fine. So the next time that someone asks you, who knows it might be a lot of you. And this, no, it doesn't matter, they may not be old. We don't know when we're going to die. <laughs> you can be there. 
And the whole point is, it's just worth doing. You don't do it for the money, you do it for the joy of it, for the inspiration of it, for the uplift. The fact there are good people in this world, and you're one of them. You're just doing it for goodness, for kindness, for generosity, for service. Not finding faults and finding the reasons why you shouldn't. But finding some excuse, some excuse why you should. You don't find excuses to get out of things. You find excuses to do things. To be kind, to be generous. And for all of those who want to know how to meditate, inspiration is what will drive your meditation to the very depths. To make this for those who are serious Buddhists. In the Visuddhi Magga, there are 40 types of meditation. A huge number of those are inspiration methods. To inspire yourself before you even start. Things like reflection on the Buddha, the teachings, the Sangha, reflections on your generosity. I use that a lot. When I'm tired, I remember what I've given. Remember the people who've given to me. And that's when I'm tired. You this huge boost of energy. You inspire yourself. And when you inspire yourself, your back straightens, you get joy and happiness. And the Buddha said many times, this is to impress people, I know what I'm talking about, because I quote Pali every now and again, because most of the Lanka monks spoke Pali, and they say, I don't know, why don't you speak Pali? So now I'm going to do it. Sukhi no Jitan Samadhi Ati, one of my favorite sayings, is from happiness, the mind becomes still. And inspiration is a free source of happiness. You inspire yourself, you feel so good and so happy, then you try and meditate. And it's very, very easy. If you are tired, negative, fault-finding, your meditation will be a struggle. You will never find any peace at all. Inspire yourself. Look at the beautiful side. Look at the sort of fault-finding. Look at a monastery like a visitor. Look at your partner like someone else would look at them. Look at yourself like I would look at you. Seeing all their beautiful, wonderful qualities. Think, wow, I'm a really good person. Then you meditate and it's so easy. You get very still. It's a fault-finding mind. It's one of the reasons why people have difficulty enjoying life finding peace in life, finding harm, live with themselves and live with others. How on earth can you live with yourself when you've got this full fighting mind seeing all the things wrong with you? You've got more than plenty of beautiful things in you. See those and you'll find you can be at peace and happiness with yourself. And even more than that, the beauty you see in yourself and in others and in the world will then grow. If you see all the faults in the government and the system, you will riot, destroy and create more problems. You're inspired in the community in which you live. You will never destroy. You will build, beautify, progress and create a happier and more peaceful world. Please, put away the fault finding greatly inspired mind, you'll be creating a happy life for yourself and others. Thank you for listening.